What made, with all the options you probably had, the UAB job the one that you wanted to, to take and, and build at? Alabama, the city. I didn't know much about the city. I got to know a little bit about it. Uh, saw the potential from a recruiting base, the Southeast, I, second to none. Yeah. Um, the city of Birmingham, great people. A um, lot of opportunity here. Uh, what they're committed to doing based on building this building we're sitting in right yeah. now, a $19 million um, practice facility, the stadium, protective stadium, um, bringing football back. Mm -hmm. You know, that was a, a, a huge yeah. um, deal for this community. You're also competing in the transfer portal with these with these Power 5 schools. You're really not, though. Listen, the real numbers are like 15 to 25 million mm -hmm. against 300 to 500 grand. Yeah. We're the Oakland A's, yeah. right? We are Moneyball. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but I love that challenge. Like, I really feel like the last three weeks, being Billy Bean has been kind of fun. What's up, guys? Welcome into the Next Up podcast. I'm Adam Brenneman. We are on campus at UAB today, University of Alabama, Birmingham, talking to their head coach, Trent Dilfer. You've heard of Coach Dilfer before. Super Bowl winning quarterback, uh, was on TV with ESPN for a long time. Uh, Elite 11 coach, you saw him on TV and on social media doing that, now building this UAB program. He's a great guy with an awesome story. You guys are gonna love hearing from him and all of his insights through his life, through adversity, through his time around football. He has so many great things to share and I've been trying to have Coach on for a long time, so excited to bring it to you. Before we get there, please like this podcast. Please subscribe to it if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening, leave us a rating, share it with someone. Anything you guys can do to support the podcast allows me to travel around the country and have on great guests and bring you an inside look at college football that you can't get anywhere else. So let's go talk to Coach Dilfer. Next up. What's up, guys? It's Adam Brenneman. It's now holiday season. You guys are looking for gifts. I'm telling you right now, check out our merch store. We have super high quality merch. My favorite is this college football tee. If you're a college football fan, you need this thing. We have college basketball tees, tons of merch for college sports fans. Use the code ADAMB15 for 15% off at checkout. Go get some college football merch and check out our other styles today. I went to write on his today and I couldn't even write on it. Especially the one that he put all the lines. Yes. Yeah, you go to write and it's like. That's the typical football guy having the whole wall as the whiteboard. Yeah. That's how you know you're, <laughs> you're dialed in. We're good, Thomas? Yes, sir. Coach, I appreciate you doing this. Yeah. I've been wanting to have you on for a long time, so I'm excited to talk to you. There's so much to talk to you about. Did you personally sit in a chair higher than me? I mean, I know you're taller it, it, than is me. Is this higher than you? Golly, okay, there we go. I'm a little bit taller. I have bad, you are. I have bad <laughs> posture anyway, so. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's so much to talk to you about, and uh, and it's been cool following this new part of your life, your mm -hmm. football journey as a coach. So I want to start with the present, uh, right here at UAB. When you took this job uh, earlier in 2023, what was the one thing that surprised you the most as a first-time college head coach? You know, I get asked that question a lot. I I don't know if I was surprised by anything. Yeah. Um, I'd been around, you know, you know, on the high school side of it, I saw it from that lens. So yeah. college coaches on campus all the time, talked to them, understood the challenges, understood the new climate of college football. When I was at ESPN and Elite 11, same I thing. Saw yeah. I, I kind of saw it all. Yeah. Um, so I didn't walk in the building and go, <gasps> you know. <laughs> uh, I think the, the biggest challenge, and I'm getting a little ahead here, that I learned during the season was the balance of recruiting in season. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm a ball guy. I'm yeah. a, the last game's over, you watch the tape, you flush it, and then your whole life is devoted. Yeah. And my family knows this as a yeah. player, as a coach. Your life is devoted to getting your players answers mm -hmm. to win the test the mm -hmm. next week. And all of a sudden you throw in in-season recruiting to that. <laughs> like, well, I, I didn't have a second of free time. Yeah before you threw this one on me, and now I'm being told like, this is really important, so I yeah. better do it. That was the biggest challenge, was yeah. now creating time out of nowhere yeah. to all of a sudden dive into in-season recruiting, which I did, I mean, with yeah. both feet, and uh, it's a very important part of this, but to balance the two was the one challenge that I was not ready for. Yeah, what, what made you, you know, I, I think about your, your career as a Super Bowl champion, and all the success you had on TV, and then building the business of Elite 11 mm -hmm. to a global brand. Uh, like, What made you want to become a, first a high school head coach, and then become a college head coach? Because I think I saw a quote you said one time, like, you don't, I don't need this job. Yeah. This isn't for the money, right? Yeah. It's the similar stories here. I'll, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. The high school thing was I felt was a calling. You know, I had, I had every 
male's American dream. Mm -hmm. I had retired. <clears throat> um, I made a bunch of money without doing anything. <laughs> I lived on a mansion on a lake, and I played golf 218 <laughs> times in 2018. Like, that was my 218. life. 218 <laughs> in 2018. I... Went and saw my girls play volleyball. Oh. I played golf. I ate at fancy restaurants. I hung out with cool people. Like, that's what I did. I was mm -hmm. retired at 40, whatever that was, 45, 40, mm -hmm. yeah, 45 years old. And it was fun. And I would never say it wasn't fun. And I actually really appreciate those years because I did it for three years. And then I realized, woke up one morning, I'm like, nothing wakes me up with like the hair on my arm standing up. Mm -hmm. My girls' careers are winding down. Plus, I never want to be the dad that like lived through his girls' wins and losses. Um, I didn't have any, no juice. And my kids were starting to tell me, my wife was starting to tell me <laughs> like, you're different. Yeah. And they were nice about it at first. They were uh, like, you're just not the same. You've lost your edge, uh, you've lost your juice, you're not in very good shape, you're not taking <laughs> care of yourself. Uh, and so I kind of felt like I needed to do something hard and I had kind of built all the things you're talking about on a couple of principles, do hard things, be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And here I am going around speaking to people about this, here I'm mentoring people on these you know, core values and I'm not doing it. Yeah. And I was basically a hypocrite. Yeah. So I needed to do something hard in my life. I remember coming home from church one day and telling my wife, I said, and my youngest daughter, and I said, we're going to be missionaries in China. <laughs> and they're like, what? <laughs> yeah, Dad, we know you're crazy, but no, I'm like, we need like the hardest challenge in the world is what yeah. we need to go do. And that ended up becoming a high school football coach in Nashville <laughs> and, and taking something over that was really in the dust and building something pretty cool. Uh, and then it was kind of the same thing. You know, I was being courted by UAB and a couple other schools towards the end of last year. And I was interested. I, I'm not going to lie. I was interested. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what the challenge was. And I went down the, the rabbit hole of a couple of interviews and researching and, and whatnot. And then one night I looked at my wife and I said, I don't think I'm going to do this. Like it was late at night because I, I had promised my high school program well, I promised myself and Sione mm -hmm. and Joey, I said, hey, I'm not going to take one second out of what we're trying to do. Because we were truly, I, I would argue, the, the last team I had in Nashville was the greatest team in the history of Tennessee high school football. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want them to be cheated one second. Yeah. So I would work till 9, 9.30 on that, and then I'd work from about 9.30 to 1 in the morning on the college mm -hmm. stuff. And it was late. She'd already fallen asleep, woke back up, fallen asleep. Yeah. It was about midnight-ish. And I looked at her and I said, I don't think I'm going to do this. And she goes, yeah, you are. I'm like, what are you talking about? Were you bossing me around? She goes, yeah, because you're bored again. Yeah. She goes, like, I, you're going to win every game by 50. Yeah. What are you going to do next year? Win them by 70? Yeah. And we were loaded mm -hmm. behind the last team. And she goes, so is, are you going to be fulfilled if you just go beat everybody by 70? Like, you're not going to be able to travel to L.A. and play Bosco. They're not going to play. What are you going to yeah. do? Go down to Alabama and play somebody else? You're going to go to Georgia and play somebody else? Mm -hmm. Like, that's not going to fuel your fire. You need another mountain to climb. Mm -hmm. Because you're a better husband. You're a better father. When you have a mountain to climb, she goes, so quit trying to find a way not to do it. And let's yeah. find a way to do this. She goes, I don't care which one. She goes, just make sure that I get the you that you were when you took the high school job because that's a better version of you. Yeah. What was the process like then when you took the UAB job? That whirlwind of the first first time college head coach uh, dealing with the transfer portal, recruiting <laughs> recruiting your own roster, yeah. right? You don't know, you gotta, you gotta build a staff. Yeah. I, I've, uh, you know, so much had to be going on in that first couple of weeks on the job. It was insanity and, and you know, playing, so it gets leaked early. Yeah. Um, and we still have the state championship game to play, which in that period of my life was the most important thing I had in my life. Yeah. I did not want to cheat these kids, that community, those coaches. So um, it gets leaked, having to do the damage control of that, which my community in Nashville handed, handled amazingly yeah. well. Uh, coming down here for a press conference mm -hmm. before we play the game. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, people yeah. forget. I came yeah. down here and did the presser, yeah. get back in the car and go to Chattanooga, <laughs> win that one by a million, yeah. and then drive down and start the job. Yeah. So um, it was crazy. Luckily, I, I give Brian Vincent a lot of credit. He mm -hmm. was the interim coach here, now the new coach at ULM. Uh, he was super gracious. He mm -hmm. opened up this building to me, this office to me. Uh, I had a deal with him. I said, listen, I am not going to coach this team. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get in your way. You have a bowl game to win. I don't want to be a disruptive force. In fact, one time I offered me, hey, if you want to put me on a project for the bowl game, like I'll cut up some tape, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll do whatever. Tag the film. And yeah. I literally sat right over there on the other side of the desk, 
um, those first couple of weeks while he worked mm -hmm. and and just said, okay, well, everything's important, what's urgent? And yeah. I lived my whole first part of my life with here with, okay, balancing, okay, everything's important. Now, which things are urgent? We had to recruit, we had to recruit yeah. this roster. So getting to the Jacob Zenos, getting to Quez Yates, guys that we knew we had seen on film, we Fish McWilliams, D Mac, these guys that we knew were good mm -hmm. players, um, starting to establish relationships with them, telling them, hey, you should not trust me. Like yeah. trust is earned, but let me, give me a chance to earn your trust. Mm -hmm. um, flying to the Bahamas, still interacting with some of them. Um, and then building a staff, mm -hmm. building a staff they recruit. We didn't have a recruiting department. So building a staff that were really good recruiters. Now, one was in Alabama, one was in South Carolina, toured Ohio State. So they're getting ready for big bowl games. They have really big jobs mm -hmm. and they're recruiting here. Um, hiring support staff was really important because these buildings, I don't know how much you've done this on the show, but these buildings don't run with support, yeah. don't run well mm -hmm. without support staff. I mean, your yeah. DFO, your video guy, your director of player personnel, your recruiting department, I mean, they all, mm -hmm. your analysts, your GAs, like without those people, these buildings don't run well. Mm -hmm. So putting that together, it was drinking by a fire, it was drinking by eight fire hoses. Yeah. Um, never slept. I mean, I, I think for that month, I probably averaged two to four hours a night of sleep, <laughs> ate too much, put on too much weight, um, but just tried to like at least scrape something together early on so that we had a foundation laid for when the kids came back for school, that at least we could start the building process yeah. with them. What, what made, with all the options you probably had, the UAB mm -hmm. job the one that you wanted to, to take and, and build at? Uh, Alabama, the city. I didn't know much about the city. I got to know a little bit about it. Uh, saw the potential from a recruiting base, the Southeast, yeah. I, second to none. Yeah. Um, the city of Birmingham, great people. A um, lot of opportunity here. Mm -hmm. uh, what they're committed to doing based on building this building, we're sitting in right yeah. now a $19 million um, practice facility, the stadium, protective stadium, um, bringing football back. Mm -hmm. You know, that was a, a, a huge yeah. um, deal for this community. Um, what was that, 2017 when that came yeah. out? Wow. And yeah. for me, it was, you know, I have, selfishly, my oldest daughter is 27, married, has my grandson, which, mm -hmm. by the way, grandsons are the best thing in the history <laughs> of the world. Um, my middle daughter I knew was going to end up in the Southeast. She's now playing for the Professional Volleyball, Professional Volleyball Federation in um, Atlanta, so mm -hmm. she's in the Southeast. And my youngest is marrying a kid from Huntsville. Okay. So I'm going to have my yeah. whole family. Right in the yeah. Southeast. So uh, I definitely wanted to be in the Southeast. Yeah. I did not want to be too far from Nashville um, because we have great ties up there. So there's some regional stuff that made yeah. this very attractive. Yeah. Well, speaking of the build of the last year here, what, what are the challenges that you've seen of being at a, at a G5 school mm -hmm competing against the power fives of not just Alabama and Auburn, but you're competing against, it's a national sport now, right? There's no regionalization of college football anymore. So what, what are the challenges you've seen over the last year? They're endless. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying this, listen, I love being here. I don't know if I even would do the P5 thing because they have their own sets of challenges. Yeah. Um, but you're the have nots. Mm -hmm. Like in, in college football, you're the have nots. Mm -hmm. um, now you can use it as a badge of honor, and I think you, you get a grittier player because of that. Um, you get a player many times that loves football more than what football brings them. Mm -hmm. But the economic gap is such, it's a, it, it, you can't even comprehend it, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes, you can see some data printed out and be like, oh, okay, an SEC team gets this mm -hmm. and a group five team gets that. But then there's so many other yeah. buckets mm -hmm. that are completely full in the power five world and are leaking heavily yeah. in the group yeah. of five level. They're empty. Mm -hmm. um, so the economics is just, it's an unfair fight. Yeah. It's completely unfair fight. And then the logo, you know, TV yeah. has made the logos that much more glamorous. I would argue in our region, college football is bigger than the NFL. Yeah. I, you know, I did the NFL for a lot of time, mm -hmm. played in it, <laughs> talked about it. Yeah. I know how big it is. You go in the Northeast, you can't have that conversation. I mean, mm -hmm. NFL is king. Down here, I'd argue that college football's bigger and yeah. it's talked about more. Uh, it's the lifeblood blood of these communities. Um, so I say that because the logo is so huge in these kids' minds. Mm -hmm. um, 
and you, that's what you're competing against and there's just really no competition yeah. with it. Now, what I do love about those challenges is that you get kids and coaches that love hard things. Mm -hmm. Like, you know the fight before you the fight. Yeah. And every interview I had with every coach, every recruit that I sit down, I make, sit down with, I make sure they understand the fight they're about to get in. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an unfair fight, but do you like those? Yeah. Like, are you the kid, are you the coach that wants your back up against the wall? Yeah. Um, because if it is, it tells me something mm -hmm. about you. Because uh, you're signing up for less glamour, less recognition, less publicity, less, less followers on social media, <laughs> yeah. less money, yeah. less stipend, whatever it is. It's just yeah. less. Yeah. Um, but the, it's still football. Yeah. It's still an opportunity to get a great degree. And it's still an opportunity to go play football on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. Speaking of, of money, and you're also competing in the transfer portal mm -hmm. with these with these Power 5 schools. You're really not though. You guys know I love football. And this football season, I've been trying to find a new way to bet on sports. I'm sick of using casinos, the traditional way to do it. And I found the best way to do it, had to tell you guys about it. It's on Cut. Cut is the game-changing social betting platform. Look no further, this is where you gotta be. It's a peer-to-peer -peer betting playground. On Cut, you can bet against your friends, bet against fellow fans on sports, politics, pop culture, and much more. It's much better than just regular sports books. Cut handles payments, so no more chasing friends for money. No more talking to a bookie. Hassle-free betting at its finest. And the best part, no more faceless casinos. It's personal and it's exciting. You can customize odds for what you want to bet on. Tailor your bets with fully customizable odds. It's your game in your rules on cut. Also, we get lower VIG on cut. Much lower VIG for a better betting experience for everybody, more winnings and less hassle. One of my favorite parts of cut is the social features. You can dive into group chats, betting leaderboards, head-to-head -head history and user profiles. It's like having a group of friends on a betting platform and betting against them if you want. Your betting experience just got a major upgrade when you use cut. And I didn't even mention that the rewards that you get on the cut app. You get cash back every time you bet against your friends. The more you bet, the more you earn. It is a win-win for everyone. Cut is legal in 40 plus Plus states, which I love because I'm traveling so much, it's hard to find sports books that are legal in most states. 40 plus states for cut, including those without traditional sports books. So put your money where your mouth is. It's time to fire on sports on the best new app. I've been looking for a long time and I found it. It's on cut. Use my promo code Adam B and get a 10% deposit match at cut.com. That's cut.com, K U T T.com. Use my code Adam B for a 10% deposit match when you deposit money. Again, cut.com, K U T T. Get a 10% deposit match when you use my code Adam B. And guys, supporting our sponsors helps us so much helps me personally be able to travel around the country and bring on amazing guests so go support cut today you're also competing in the transfer portal mm -hmm. with these with these power five schools you're really not though well well yeah with, well, with, well with, with with your own roster <laughs> yeah. but yes it's hard to compete right because yeah. you're not competing financially no. right i think to your point you're not, you're not even close <laughs> yeah. i mean you're people are going to say numbers listen the real numbers are like 15 to 25 million mm -hmm. against 300 to 500 grand yeah like that's the gap, it's people. It's a why. Yeah. Like, yeah. don't think that <laughs> your little group of five school can compete. It's not even a competition. Yeah. Um, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so when people see you're competing against the the power of fives, yeah. the portal, I'm like, no, true. we're not. Yeah. We're not cutting up kids <laughs> yeah. in the portal. Like our personal department isn't cutting up kids that are possible power five portal transfers. Mm -hmm. Just the economics of it. You're yeah. just not going to do it. Yeah. Um, so you start your recruiting in the portal with your own team, mm -hmm. right? That's number one. Retention is number one because we have really good players and we have yeah. players that we're developing and we're players that fit in our system. And then it's like, okay, after the P5s go through all these and mm -hmm. after all the economics and the negotiations are yeah. going on, which ones make us better and fit who we're, what we're about and are affordable? Yeah, and we can get. Yeah. We're the Oakland A's, yeah. right? We are Moneyball. <laughs> So, yeah. um, but I love that challenge. Like, yeah. I really feel like the last three weeks being Billy Bean has been kind of fun. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and we've gotten our tails kicked on some things, and that's okay right. because you're you're constantly you're doing a value proposition on every um, kid you're looking at because it's not just his traits, it's not just his experience, it's not just his production, it's his affordability. Yeah. Yeah, one of the, one of your big wins so far has been your quarterback, Jacob yeah, Zeno. The biggest who, win in the history of the program. Yeah, I mean, I, from I, I, I'm assuming, and and I've heard rumors yeah. that there were opportunities for him to leave for a yeah. lot more money and Absolutely. go and go to Power Five schools. What was that process like for you as a head coach? And then how'd you how'd you get him to stay? Well, transparency number one, and yeah. you're going to talk to him, and he'll. I'd be shocked if he didn't tell you this exact story. I sat him down before the season's over, and I said, "Listen, man, I'd be a terrible friend." 
<laughs> I'd be a terrible mentor yeah. if I didn't tell you that here's what's about to happen yeah. and you're not going to hurt my feelings if mm. you go look at it. Like, you're just not. Yeah. Like, part of me wants to even tell you that um, you're better off doing it. Yeah. You know, from an economic standpoint. Mm. Um, and he did. And again, I, I don't know what we can and can't talk about because of tampering, all that crap. I mean, tampering happens every, every day. day. <laughs> yeah. um, there's agents involved. I've heard that he's been he was offered between four hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars, and none of that surprises me. And we mm. can't even come close. I'm not going to tell you what we're able to do for our collective, <laughs> but it's it's a. <laughs> A fraction. It's a flea <laughs> on your ass compared to that, right? So I knew that was going to be a part of the deal, and I wanted, to know, I wanted him to know from me, the head coach, and, and he's going to have his office coordinator, his quarterback coach leaning into this and his friends leaning into this, but from your head coach, I'll, I want you back. I love you. You're only going to be better. I'm going to do everything in my power to develop you so you can be a draft pick. Like, you'll get the best of us. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have good things about this building. We're going to get better up front. We're going to protect you better. We're always going to have playmakers. You're going to, be to throw the football. You're going to run a pro-style offense. You're going to have good backs. Uh, you're going to have a system where you have the keys to the car. Like All those, I guess, are selling points, but they're truths, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, the challenge for him and, and, and any quarterback that's going to play for us is, is does that – does little money now for big money later outweigh guaranteed medium money now mm -hmm. in the big scheme of things for maybe not big money later? Because yeah. I would argue this, and I'll say this very bluntly, and I don't really give a shit who questions me on this. We'll develop a quarterback here better than anybody in the country. Mm -hmm. Nobody can yeah. touch us on that. Yeah. Um, so if you're a quarterback, you're going to want to be here. Yeah. If you trust that, mm -hmm. but if you want all the other crap that comes with playing quarterback, then there's probably better places yeah. because playing quarterback here is really hard too. Mm -hmm. And I hope you ask them that yeah. because it's not kumbaya. Mm -hmm. It's not, you're the greatest thing of all time. I mean, the mm -hmm. kid had these amazing games and he's in my office on Monday and I'm giving <laughs> him a laundry list of all the stuff he's got to do better. Yeah. Right. But he's that kind of kid. Yeah. He wants that. Yeah. And I think that's what anybody that wants to be great. That's their approach is, yeah, give me constructive feedback. Like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not judging myself. I'm not pouring perfume on myself as a player because what some stat line says, yeah. you know, I want to actually play the position the way the best people in the world play it. Yeah. Um, then that stuff will take care of itself. And, and that's what he gets here. Yeah. And, and I think that's why he stayed because he's, he's made differently and, and uh, he understands there's a bigger thing going on here than yeah. just some medium money right now. Yeah, you don't get many chances to play for a Super Bowl winning quarterback as a. Well, it's not coach, just right? me. I, I'm probably the least of the. Pit. I mean, <laughs> your offense coordinator is as good yeah. as anybody in the country. Your quarterback coach is as good as anybody in the country. We have four other people in this building. People know their names. There's as good a quarterback people mm -hmm. as there are in, in college football. So you're you're in a quarterback think tank. Yeah. And anytime he gets a game plan, he knows that this was developed by some of the better quarterback minds in, yeah. in all of football. Yeah. Um, and he's got, you know, he's got resources. Like mm -hmm. I've seen him talk to some of these guys in the middle of practice and about something that might be going on. I'm like, good, I'm glad he's talking to him because that guy yeah. probably knows what he's talking to him about better than I do or maybe as good as Mort yeah. or better than Nick. Like he has these endless resources available to him to get a, a master's, a PhD in yeah. quarterbacking yeah. while he's in yeah. college. Yeah. We were talking before we started rolling a little bit about the coach's calendar right now, mm -hmm. just the recruiting calendar. Uh, the last few weeks had to have just been wild <laughs> for you, right? And, and, and we were saying that, imagine having to play a game right now, right? You, with with re high school recruiting, today was signing day, transfer portal, your own roster, the stuff we just talked about with your quarterback. What, what was it? Take me through the last couple of weeks, a, a schedule of what, what that looked like. Well, I think every, every coach is going to say they crushed recruiting, right? I mean, you have to. <laughs> yeah. You have to come out and say, oh, we got everything we wanted. <laughs> yeah. Total lie. Yeah. But um, we really do feel like we dominated this period. Mm. But when we didn't go to a bowl game, our first one, our coaches got no time off. Like, yeah. we lose a heartbreaker against North Texas on a Saturday. We fly back, they have Sunday off, but most of them, actually Sunday was optional. Yeah. <laughs> most of them were in Not the really. office. Yeah, most of them were in the office. Yeah. Monday, the first meeting that morning, staff meeting was like, okay, here's the deal. You know, a bunch of teams are going to bowl games. Mm -hmm. um, we got to make sure we dominate them. 
we have to use this period of time. We had to turn heartbreak yeah. right into victory. Mm -hmm. And here's how we do it. We attack these three weeks like nobody's ever attacked them and we have no distractions. Mm -hmm. Now these other teams, they have, their, their head coaches are gonna say the same thing, but they have natural distractions mm -hmm. that because they're playing in a bowl game that we don't have. So yeah. let's make sure we capitalize on that. I say that because I can't, I'm gonna experience it and we're gonna have a plan for it. But if you're in a bowl game right now, I think the craziest dynamic is your, your job title is to help that player who's on your team get ready to play his best football in the next football ga game he plays. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, as that's our, co that's our coach's creed. Like mm -hmm. that's our soul should be wrapped up to help our players play yeah. their best football the next chance they have time to play football. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not doing that. They're yeah. recruiting. So if you're the second string right tackle, and you're not getting coached very hard for the bowl game. You're not feeling very taken care of because mm. you know your coach, by the way, he's not going to practice today because he's on the road recruiting <laughs> my replacements. <laughs> yeah. Like, there's, that's what's not talked about either. It's not yeah. just balancing recruiting and getting for a bowl game. It's like, you're cheating yeah. on me. It's almost <laughs> like you're dating somebody, right? Yeah. Take her out to a nice restaurant. You're, you know, blah, blah, blah. Hey, excuse me, sweetie. I need to go outside, <laughs> right? I need to walk down the you block the call. <laughs> to the other honey yeah. Yeah. and make a phone. Not just make a phone yeah. call. I'm going to yeah. go sit just and have yeah. drinks with her, too. <laughs> I mean, that's what's yeah. going on. Like, you're at practice at whatever team, yeah. and you're like, well, you know, I'm not going to go to practice today. I'm going to go recruit your replacement. How's yeah. that kid feeling? Yeah. I, I think that's one of the craziest things about this process right now is you're literally cheating on your players if you're getting ready for a bowl game going to recruit. And I know they're smart enough to feel it. That's one thing I've learned. Now, yeah. I raised them, so I knew this already. They're smart. Right? They're smart. Yeah. Kids are smart, man. Yeah. My girls were smart when they were in college. <laughs> These guys are smart. Like they know when you're yeah. lying to them. That's why we're so brutally honest around here. Like yeah. we are brutally honest to our players because yeah. I don't want them to think we're lying. I, I don't want them to ever feel like they can't trust us. They may not like what we're saying, yeah. but I don't want them to feel like we're lying to them. Yeah. I'm sure you've thought about this a lot and with some of the challenges. What's one, I don't want to ask you what's the solution for college football, but if you could change one thing about it or make one change right now, what would it be? The count, I don't, I like the portal. Yeah. I like NIL. Um, I wish I had NIL when all these Fresno people were in my jersey and I was getting $471 a month, including <laughs> Pell Grant. You know what I mean? Like, I was broke, broke, and I was married. My wife had to stop being the captain of the swim team for a future Olympic swim coach to go coach swimming so we could have $1,400 and 71 or $1,400, yeah, just about $1,500 a month to live off of in college. Um, so I love that these kids have the opportunity to have a little extra money in their pocket. Um, it's the timing of it all. It's, and I always, I've said this to my staff, I've said this to the players. You know, Tony Dungy, I learned a lot from Tony. One of the best things I learned from him was making wise decisions, mm -hmm. not making emotional decisions. And at the end of every season, he would, he would in a team meeting and say, hey guys, this is gonna end one of two ways. We're gonna win the Super Bowl, and when you win the Super Bowl, everybody thinks has too high of an opinion of themselves. And they're emotionally wrapped up in themselves. They're all legends in their own mind. It'll happen to you guys too one day when you win the Super Bowl. The flip side of that is if you don't win the Super Bowl, you're miserable. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> knives in the eyes miserable. Yeah. If you're a true competitor. If you're a true competitor, you've invested everything you have into trying to win the last game of the year. And you don't win that last game, you yeah. should be miserable. I always make the joke, and my wife will roll her eyes and say, you know, when we lost, if we didn't win the last game there, my wife was ugly, I didn't like my kids, my food <laughs> didn't taste good, I was grumpy all the time, for about two weeks. Yeah. And so Tony would say, don't make any decisions for two weeks. Mm -hmm. that, I think this is a great time to spend your money and go to Mexico, go to Hawaii, go play golf, go fishing. Whatever mm -hmm. you do, get away from football when it's over for two weeks and don't make any decisions. And then process it all, then come back. Yeah. and make some decisions. I think that's just a good life principle for all of us, right? Yeah. Don't make any big life decisions right after something very dramatic happened. Yeah. Well, when's the portal open? Yeah. Right after, right after. the yeah. season. Yeah. When everybody, coach, player, DFOs, student workers, everybody's emotional. Yeah. Everybody's heartbroken. Good or bad. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. like not making wise yeah. decisions. And now you add money into that 
and you're going to get a lot of poor decision making by us too. Mm -hmm. Like all of a sudden, a kid that's you know week seven, man, this guy's a good player, he's great, mm -hmm. drops the ball in week twelve, and all of a sudden he's the worst player, and, player. You're trying, <laughs> and you're trying to replace him in the portal. Yeah, right. So I first thing I, I I wanted to make sure I was being true to my word. So I went back and cut ups were so important to me because I just started grinding through cut ups on our team. Yeah. I wanted to have a very clear perspective of our team. Mm -hmm. um, I start watching practice clips. We have a lot of really young, good young players. We played 24 freshmen or retro freshmen. Jeez. So we have a lot of really yeah. good young players. So I back and watch these players in practice. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, I want to make sure I'm valuing, valuing them correctly mm -hmm. and not being emotional, emotional when boom, 3,000 kids pop up there and yeah. you're like, oh, that kid's better than my kid. Well, no, no, hold on a second. Yeah. Let's evaluate our players. Let's have a non-emotional evaluation mm -hmm. about them. Let's grade them. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure I did my staff. Every staff member had to do a big time. And my evaluations are relentless now. Like they are big time really? evaluations yeah. um, that I make the staff do. So I take mine, I take the staff, and now I have a composite mm -hmm. of the intangible makeup of the kid that I'm already coaching, the physical traits, the vision for this player, mm -hmm. the mission for them to get there, their ceiling and their floor. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, now I'm not emotional anymore. I know who my yeah. team is. Okay, now start cutting up the portal. And it was amazing, all these kids that jumped in the portal that as I started watching cutups, I'm like, yeah, that's a good player, he's not better than mine. Yeah. That's a good player, he's not better than mine. That's a good player, not better than mine. Mm -hmm. He might have more experience. He might be at a bigger logo school. He might have had more stars coming out of high school. Yeah. But an objective evaluation mm -hmm. of my players opposed to the players I was watching um, now I can make some, some wise decisions in that process. And then there's the economic piece we really talked about. Now I will say this, I've had players in my exit meetings knowing I was doing that, that were really appreciative of that. Yeah. I can think of five kids that sat in those chairs and were like, coach, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. You're not just running on to the next thing yeah. that you really know who I am. Cause I share those evaluations with those players. Yeah. Like, hey, you are a high ceiling mid floor player. You're still young, early in your development. Mm -hmm. Your traits put you in the NFL, these metrics. Here's my vision for who you're gonna be next year. Yeah. Here's the plan for you as we move forward. And they're like, oh my gosh, thank you. Yeah. Well, I think that's why we haven't been killed in the portal because at least they know we're giving them honest feedback and we're evaluating them before we make some knee jerk reaction to go jump into the portal. Yeah. So these three weeks, I know it's a dull for answer, long winded answer. These three <laughs> weeks are crazy when you're not just going, oh, there's a cute little toy in the portal. Let's yeah, bring him in on an OV. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing with the portal is like, it just moves so fast, yeah. right? Like if a guy is the portal, you got to make a decision quick huh? or else he's, or he's you don't, don't, or you don't. Uh, to, or to you your just point. make a decision you don't. To your like, point. Today's episode is brought to you by Ekron Athletics. Listen, you guys know I was an injury prone player during my playing career. Felt like I was hurt having surgery every other season. Looking back on it, I wasn't recovering the right way. So now in my post playing career, I've made it a mission to figure out how to recover best. And that's when I found Ekron Athletics. Their B37S percussion massage gun, this thing right here, has changed the way I recover after big workouts. I wish I had this thing when I was playing. It was named the best overall massage gun by GQ, Sports Illustrator and other trusted publications. I'm telling you, every player and athlete out there should be using this thing to recover after workouts and games and to get loose before games and practices. And even if you're not playing sports and using it before the gym and after the gym, I use it when I'm sitting at home watching college football every Saturday. I mean, this thing is beautiful. I love it. I take it with me everywhere I go, even on the road when I travel. Oh, and the B37S massage gun is not just about a quick fix. It's got a long battery life and it comes with a lifetime warranty guaranteeing this thing lasts much longer than my football career did. Whether you're a current athlete, a former athlete, or just an everyday person trying to stay in shape, you need to try the B37S percussion gun from Ekron Athletics. Go to EkronAthletics.com today and start recovering faster and moving easier. That's Ekron Athletics and use promo code NEXTUP for 25% off your purchase. That's E-K-R-I-N Athletics.com with promo code NEXTUP for 25% off your purchase. Our personnel department does an incredible job uh, coach runs in the office, hey, we need this guy cut up. And they are all hands on deck yeah. from five. They all get here about five in the morning. They all leave about eight, nine o'clock at night. <laughs> and it is nonstop. Yes, sir. Boom, 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 boom. I want 36 worst plays. Great. Done. 10 minutes later, 36 worst plays. I want 150 targets. Great. 150 targets. I want mm -hmm. versus opponent. Blah, blah, blah. That opponent. 
And because of technology, we do invest a lot in technology. Um, we're able to get these things turned around really well, really quickly. And what, in my opinion, do a really thorough job uh, of our evaluations. People forget, one of my best friends is Trent Balke, who's the general manager of the yeah. Jaguars. He built that 49ers team from mm -hmm. the dust. I know it didn't end well for him, but he's been one of the best GMs in football at two different spots yeah. now. And I've learned a lot of my evaluation tools from him. Yeah. And thoroughness is one of them. It's not just taking a small sample size yeah. to evaluate a player. Um, so we do a very, very large sample size in our evaluations of players. So therefore we can't make the quick decisions. Yeah. So we have in real time been evaluating a player and lost on a portal kid. And my answer to that is that's okay. Yeah. Because if to, to actually sign that kid, we would have had to made a knee jerk reaction no, no. Yeah. without the yeah. full evaluation and four, four transfers you're stuck with. Yeah. Cause I also want to know path court towards graduation. I want to know something from their high school. Coach, teacher, I want to know something about their background. I want to know about their family. Yeah. I want to know about their decision making. I want yeah. to know um, do they smoke a bunch of weed or yeah. do they not? You know, yeah. I want to know a bunch Medical of different things. things. Medical. Yeah. I want to yeah. know everything. I want yeah. to composite. Yeah. Um, I always call it a dossier. Like, yeah. give me a dossier on a player. If you can't, then we're not going to sign them. And sure, yeah. we're going to lose out on some really talented players. But what we're not going to do is bring in cancers. Yeah. Yeah, I see around this building a bunch of quotes and, and uh, sayings on the wall. What, what are your core values as a head coach mm -hmm. that you instill in this program? You know, again, I think times I can be too wordy. I've tried to, <laughs> I've, I've tried to uh, as everybody knows right now, and I think kids want very distinct things. I think the number one thing is to be great at anything, you have to embrace hard things. Yeah, It's a hard road. There's it's two a, roads. It's a great one. There's yeah. a narrow road. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And there's a wide open road. The wide open road's easy. The narrow road's hard. To be great. And everybody talks about it. Everybody in your podcast has talked about it. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the media talks about it. Everybody uses the same words. I've lived it. Yeah. I've been around 12 Hall of Famers. Yeah. Uh, it's never pretty. Mm -hmm. It's never easy. It's harder than people can comprehend. And at some point, you fall in love with the heart. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to make things very, very difficult around here. That doesn't mean mean. Talk to any of my players. Like, it's not mean. Yeah. It's just hard. Just the standard is higher. The drills are harder. The off-season training is harder. The mental work is harder. The walkthroughs are harder. The padding's harder. The meetings are harder. Like, we just want a ton of hard. Mm -hmm. Because if you, at some point, when you're done complaining about it, which I did as a player, you yeah. probably did as a player, <laughs> and then you embrace it, you're like, oh, gosh, everything's easy. after. Like, yeah. the actual thing I have to go do is pretty <laughs> yeah, easy because so, everything yeah. else is so dang hard. Yeah. Um, that's one of them. Um, I always say the edge of uncomfortable is where you find greatness. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can, I think this year I made a massive mistake in this program by making it too comfortable. I think there has to be a level of being uncomfortable, everybody, um, because that's really where you find that greatness. Mm -hmm. I think you focus on things you can control, yeah. right? I think that's one of my core values is, is stay focused on the things that you can control. You can control your effort, you can control your energy, you can control your attitude. Um, you control how many times you can refocus and time, you know, yeah. throughout a day. You can't control much else. Yeah. Like let that thing, don't let that stuff get in the way of your path. Um, and then, you know, everybody has the touchy feely stuff. Mm -hmm. um, love. Yeah. And I love it. I, and I'm that way, but yeah. I, I don't brand it. Yeah. For us, I would call it transparency. We are who we are. Mm -hmm. um, you, if you interviewed, we have 120 players on the roster. We have another you know, call them 70 staffers, let's call around 200 people in the building. I bet you can't find one that doesn't feel like we're honest, we care about them, we truly authentically want what's best for them. Mm -hmm. um, we're not, I'm not using this as a launching point. This is not an ambition yeah. <laughs> play for me. I'm not using them to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, whatever word that is, yeah. I think that would be our touchy-feely kumbaya yeah. piece of this. Uh, value maybe I think yeah. everybody feels feels very valued in this program. Yeah, what what's something from your playing career, you know, all, all the success you had, that maybe you learned or you took with you to now being a head coach? I think I took more from my failures. To be honest with you, yeah. I, I made every mistake you can make. <laughs> um, I really did. Like I, I made them all. So I really I talked to. I, mean, I raised my daughters this way and. And I tell the kids this a lot. Jacob's heard me say this a million times is, you know, you don't have to make the mistake to learn from it. <laughs> you can watch somebody else make it. Yeah. 
and learn from it. Or you can hear me talk about how I made it and mm -hmm. what went into making it. Um, so I, I think a lot of how I've built this and, and pretty much everything I've built in my career of building stuff was from my failures and helping yeah. people not make the same mistakes I made. From the good stuff, I lean a lot on the great players and coaches I played for and with. So like I said, 12 Hall of Famers, some of the greatest coaches I've ever coached football, um, Mike Holmgren, Tony Dungy, um, Marvin Lewis, Marvin mm -hmm. Lewis, Rex Ryan, Jack Del Rio, all on the same staff in Baltimore. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, <laughs> you know, Sam Weish was a very successful head coach. Jim mm -hmm. Sweeney, who people don't know enough about. There needs to be a documentary on Jim Sweeney, one of the great college coaches of all time um, in that era of Lavelle Edwards and Bobby Bowden. Um, Jeff Tedford, yeah. you know, was my coach. Um, Clyde Christensen, who, you know, unfortunately after he coached me, I had to go c coach Tom Brady and Peyton Manning. I feel bad for him. <laughs> um, but, you know, Clyde Christensen, I can go on and on. And then these great players, and they all have commonalities. Yeah. Um, and I've really tried to look for the commonalities and, 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 and implement their core principles into what we do. Yeah. Um, that that's really kind of my failures and learning from other great players and coaches and kind of blending it all together. Yeah, when, when you look back on that career, well, and I'll say whether it's playing career or Elite Eleven mm -hmm. or TV, uh, and you're, you're not allowed to say the the Super Bowl. What's the one thing that you're the most proud of when you look back on it? Super Bowl is such an easy answer on that, you know. <laughs> I'm most proud of what we did at Nashville. Yeah. When I walked into that program, there were 36 kids on the roster. Six wow. lifted with a PVC Didn't pipe. Couldn't even practice. Six lifted with a PVC pipe because they couldn't lift the bar. Jeez. That's what we walked into. Mm -hmm. um, a community that was broken, that once had a really good football kind of soul to it. Um, you know, just some, some racial stuff that was going on. Mm -hmm. um, it was just broken. And to see it, to leave it, in such good standing. And it wasn't just me, it took so many people to do it, but to leave it one of the premier high school programs in the country and change so many kids' lives because of their ability to get their college education paid for. Mm -hmm. People talk about all the SEC recruits we have, but I'm more proud of the kids that went and played Division II and FCS and you know, it got school paid for. Yeah. Um, they became better students, better people, really good football players, did something pretty spectacular. Because it, and the reason, and I, and we'll do it here too. We'll do yeah. the same thing here, and that will be my next most proudest thing. Um, but what, what's so rewarding about it was it took my life's experience yeah. to get to that point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know I've taken a weird road to, to coaching football, but I think, I'll go backwards a little bit. Everybody always asks me about my NFL career, and I'm like, I don't think about my NFL career very often. <laughs> it was like a blip on the radar. Now, the lessons learned from my NFL career. Yeah. Then my lessons learned from TV, my lessons learned from a business owner, my lessons learned from the Elite 11, my lessons learned by raising mm -hmm. three Division I uh, volleyball players, my lessons learned from sustaining a marriage for 31 yards, years when she probably should have left me 30 <laughs> times. You know, like the lessons learned yeah. from my journey has prepared, prepared me for the Nashville experience at Lipscomb. And I think that with my life's experiences have prepared me for the challenges here. Um, that's why I'm so proud of that one because I could see it 45 years of my life yeah. going, oh, it's awesome. that's yeah. why I did that. Yeah. That's why I went through that. Oh, mm -hmm. that's why that relationship was there. That's why, you know, that wisdom that so-and-so shared with me, I really couldn't use at ESPN, but now I can use it. Yeah. And that, that's, that was really fun. I remember driving from, we had won the game last year, driving down here to start the job. And my wife was actually driving, which hardly ever happens <laughs> um, because she got a ticket. That's why she doesn't drive very often. <laughs> um, but I remember sitting and I started tearing up and she goes, oh, you're just being emotional about that. And I said, no, I'm, I'm tearing up because I'm so dang proud of all the people that allowed that to just happen. Yeah. I remember waking up that morning wondering if we could score 100 points. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I said, I don't know if the running clock if we can score 100. I don't know <laughs> if it's possible, but I'm going to try, yeah. right? Because I want an exclamation point mm -hmm. for that community to realize what they had done. And I thought just a 100 to 0, because I knew the team we were playing wasn't going to score a point. <laughs> so I woke up that morning literally thinking, could we win a state championship 100 to 0 to reward 
four years of people that had poured their heart and souls into that yeah. thing. And uh, I was just tearing up. I'm like, man, I got to 50. Yeah. You know, we so got halfway. Cool. That stupid yeah. running clock got in the way. But uh, I was really proud of that. Yeah, I was thinking about the Elite 11. And on the way here, uh, on the flight here, I was thinking the one, there's been a one, one constant in big time college football quarterbacks. And mm -hmm. it's like all have been part of you <laughs> in your Elite 11, right? Yeah. Like every big time quarterback yeah. has been coached by Trent Dilfer. Yeah. Um, you know, and a lot of them are my buddies. And they, I was telling them, I was coming, I told you Christian Hackenberg, yeah. a bunch of other guys, they're like, tell, tell Trent, I'm like, how do you know coach? Oh yeah, Elite 11. Yeah. So uh, you built that brand into what started as a quarterback camp to mm -hmm. television and like everyone that knows football loves the Elite 11. What went into what went into actually getting that to the point that it did where it was such a global brand that everyone wanted to be part of? Well, one, you got to give Andy Bark, Bob Johnson, Brian Stump. Everybody gives me the credit for it, and I'm the first to go, oh, hold on a second. Yeah. Andy Bark, Bob Johnson, famous high school coach in California. It was their brainchild. Mm -hmm. Brian Stump, who's still the president yeah, of Brian. student yeah. sports and still runs Elite 11, uh, he's the... He's the brilliance behind it. Mm -hmm. It took their belief in me. Yeah. Uh, I took a lady named Joan Lynch, who no longer works in sports, but was an unbelievable lady, massive media mogul, um, is one of the big reasons for, 30, for the 30 for 30s at ESPN. Mm -hmm. And her, it really started with them having a vision of taking a camp and turning it into, I ended up putting words on this later, but a community. Mm -hmm. um, I, and what they needed me to do first was make it a cult. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, it had yeah. to go from camp to cult to community. Because mm -hmm. once you make something a community with today's media yeah. presence, now it can be global. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So it was the kind of their vision. They interviewed Gruden first. Mm -hmm. um, so I was the second choice, which <laughs> I love. Um, they interviewed Gruden first, and he was too busy doing ESPN Monday Night Football. I was just doing the Sunday and Monday, so it felt like my, I yeah. might have more time. <laughs> um, and they brought me in like, hey, we don't really know what this means. Yeah. We just think that you can do this. And I said, oh, yeah, I can do this because mm -hmm. I have passion for something like this. Now, man, I was coming out of playing. I was doing TV. I was looking for a passion project mm -hmm. in the spring. Uh, and this became the passion project. And um, I said, okay, it's already got a really good, it has brand value. It's, it's had impact, too. Mm -hmm. Like, it wasn't cheesy. Like, if you talk to the Breezes and the Rogers and the Roethlisbergers yeah. and those guys that went through it as the camp, they said, yeah, it's really good. Like, yeah. it's a good thing. It's better than your typical camp. Mm -hmm. How do we make it a cult and a community? And, and really, it just became connecting with kids, mm -hmm. right? I, it, people were going, no, it had to be bigger than that. No, it was just connecting with them. It was having true evaluations. So there, was day, there were years where I would watch 700 high school quarterbacks highlights, <laughs> and I'd watch... 50 full games, you know, once you kind of know. A highlight simply their ceiling. Yeah. Like, just for you recruiting guys, you can watch a highlight. All you're really seeing yeah. is their ceiling. They're not putting it out there if there's yeah. anything bad on it, yeah. right? Yeah. But then we'd go and we'd watch, okay, here's their ceiling. What's their floor? So you get mm -hmm. that from a full game or a couple full games. But I would spend hundreds and hundreds of hours um, watching high school tapes. So the kids, again, felt like I cared. Mm -hmm. um, there was a connection when we brought them into the regional camps. Um, where you really have your, your reach with them. It wasn't just a, a cattle call. Yeah. Like I heard that all the time. Like I went to this other camp and I, you know, I sat in this line and threw six balls. Exactly, yeah. I went to an Elite 11 regional yeah. and I got coached. I got cared for. They talked to me about my life. Mm -hmm. They gave me some life skills. I had great, opportunity, great opportunities to, to yeah. compete. I learned XO. Like I actually felt like I got better from it. So if you don't make the finals, you still had a great Elite 11 yeah. experience. In fact, I've heard more from kids over the past, I don't know, five, six years from kids that didn't make the finals mm -hmm. than the kids I've heard from that yeah. made the finals. Yeah. Um, and I think that that process of just connecting with kids, I'd always give a talk at every region I went to with the parents about my journey of recruiting. So we, we touched on the recruiting piece because my mm -hmm. kids were going through it. Um, and I, I just think it became this thing that was bigger than football. Yeah. And what made Elite 11, and it still makes it so good today, and I have, by the way, I have nothing to do with Elite 11 anymore. Mm -hmm. I can't, based on yeah. compliance. I can yeah. have no touch points with Elite 11. Um, but I watch it now, mm -hmm. like, because Brian's still doing a great job. That hasn't, that hasn't stopped. It's yeah. more than football. We understand that football is going to end at some point for these quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. We don't want to minimize football. It was never minimized. But we're like, at the same time, it's a both and. You can... You can chase this really cool thing, power five quarterback, group five quarterback, NFL quarterback thing, 
and still be using football to make you a better person. Yeah. Yeah. Have better habits, make mm-hmm. better decisions, be a better part of your community. And I think uh, my personal belief is that's why Elite 11 is so dominant because it stands for something more than just five-star quarterback. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, you know, there's so many different uh, parts to your journey. I want to ask next about your, <laughs> about your time on television because yeah. you were in, you know, in fall, uh, fall, you turn on the TV, you were on TV for mm-hmm. a lot of it um, for, for what, almost a, how many years? I think nine. nine I was saying almost yeah. a decade. Did you enjoy television? Did you like it? Because I, I talked to a lot of guys who actually say that they did it for a li- living but didn't love being on TV. Before we get back to the pod, we gotta talk about something super important. Fellas, I know you guys are using those sharp razors to shave your face and to shave your manly areas. I'm telling you, stop doing it. I was in your shoes. I was using regular razors and then I found Manscaped. The Manscaped sponsored the pod a few months ago and I started using their products. It has changed my routine and my life completely. I told you before about smooth sack summer. It's now fresh ball fall. You need fresh balls in the fall. There's no excuse not to be fresh. Let's be honest. We both know we go in a little bit nervous to our manly grooming routine with the regular old razors we use, but with Manscaped, it takes away any feeling of being nervous. I use the lawnmower 4.0 when I'm doing my manly grooming. I use the beard hedger for my face and the reviews have been immaculate. Just take my word on that one, boys. So I'm telling you, if you're using regular old razors, stop and use Manscaped. And you can go to manscaped.com and use my code ADAMB for 20% off and free shipping. I'm telling you guys, it's fresh ball fall. Using Manscaped will change your routine, change your manlyhood, and change your life. Manscaped.com, promo code ADAMB for 20% off and free shipping. So I, I, I have a bittersweet relationship with TV. Um, I loved, love, love, love my first, let's call it five years. Mm-hmm. I felt like I was truly able to teach football um, through a different medium, yeah. right? Um, ESPN did an incredible job giving me a very big platform. I worked with great producers, great co-talent, and it gave me an opportunity because I, I, if there are a couple times I got in some debate stuff and I regret some of those moments on TV but for the most part I was a teacher Mm -hmm. for the most part I would say okay here's what's going to happen because and let me show you evidence of that let me tell you what other really smart people are saying and what I've learned in football and that's something you can watch this game and have a better appreciation Mm -hmm. for it I can't tell you how many times I was stopped in airports because remember I was commuting from the west coast so I spent a lot of time in airports right Every and week, every week, every week, wow. and in the off season too. Yeah. Like I was in airports constantly. Um, I was a million miler on some airlines. <laughs> like, I was in the lot of airports, and I'd have a mom, um, a grandma, a lot of grandmas, uh, a lot of older gentlemen that weren't like football nuts, and a lot of kids come up to me randomly. Yeah. Like, oh, Dilfer, yeah, how you doing? I'm like, oh, what's this gonna be? And, <laughs> man, I love watching on TV because you help me watch the game better. Yeah. Like moms, like, you yeah. know, you give me something to talk to my kids about. I had one mom start crying. We're literally, I'm, I'll never forget, I was in Chicago. I'm in that back, uh, I'm in that back part of the terminal. I'm sitting there by myself, kind of <laughs> eating snacks probably. And she comes up and she starts crying. She goes, I have three sons. My husband's a football freak. And I never had any connection with them talking football. And I started overhearing you on Sunday mornings and Monday uh, pre-game show and all of a sudden I started writing the stuff down you were saying <laughs> and I started using it with my three boys and and uh, husband and all of a sudden they think I'm smart uh, and now we watch football together as a family <laughs> and awesome. I was like that's really cool yeah. like that's what I felt like my influence was my first five years on TV then it got weird mm-hmm. TV got weird man it got people telling you what you should be talking about and what was important and what wasn't important it wasn't about football all of a sudden the politics and the buildings started determining what people got the chance to say what, where. Mm-hmm. Um, it, if it was a hot button topic that Twitter at the time was trending on, then it made the front of the show, whether it was a premier game or not. Like all these other things mm-hmm. started creeping in. And that, with on top of me going from you know, the Bay Area in California on a red eye to New York and car servicing from New York to Bristol and then a flight to Monday Night Football and then a flight back to the West Coast and my daughter's now playing state championships and my one daughter at Notre Dame and I'm stopping off yeah. in South Bend before I went home and another one's at TCU and it just got overwhelming yeah. and uh, didn't love it. 
Uh, didn't I, I, my favorite year was when I was doing Ray, Steve, and me. We're working together on Monday night. Well, then they're breaking up the band. The Stuart Scott mm -hmm. thing really hurt me. You know, he's a yeah. dear friend. I loved working with Stuart. I have some more funny memories with Stuart on the road than like that. That was a hard one to get over. So just things start piling up, and uh, I didn't enjoy it. And it wasn't all the TV stuff. It was just the lifestyle. Um, and then I made some really stupid decisions. You know, I. I got involved in a contract negotiation um, that I should not have done looking back at it, and which made things weird with my bosses. And the la it just got funky at the end, and it was better for everybody mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that I was off TV. And I'm sure the 50% that hated me are like, great, get him <laughs> off. But the next bald guy on, I mean, really all they did was trade me out for Hasselback, one of my best friends. <laughs> and now they've traded Hasselback out for Alex Smith, who uh, I mentored in San Francisco. <laughs> like, I, I know that's a long-winded answer, but I've never, really never had the platform to tell people either. Yeah. Um, I always said this when I was on TV, 50%, if you do your job well, 50% are going to love you. Yeah. They're just going to love you because connect with them, you teach them something, and there's always going to be 50% that hate you. Yeah. Um, those 50%, because you might tell them something about their team that they don't want to hear. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing about TV is people have already made up their mind. No doubt, yeah. People have already made yeah. up their mind before <laughs> anything comes out of your mouth. Yeah. So you're either reinforcing something they mm -hmm. believe in or you're contradicting something they believe in. Mm -hmm. Therefore, just by the nature of that, some yeah. people are going to love you. Yeah. Some people are going to hate you. The difference is some people are very gifted mm -hmm. at telling you something you already believe mm -hmm. or something that you disagree with. If they're very gifted at it, it's just going to amplify how much they love you or how much they hate no you. <laughs> the thing that bothers me now, and I don't watch very much of it, I watch really? more college football stuff than pro football stuff, is these analysts really actually think they're making a difference. <laughs> Like, like it's, the most, <laughs> it's the most narcissistic thing out there. Like I watch Fox News, CNN News and ESPN or whatever it is. And these people actually think they're changing the world. And I'm here to tell you, no, you're not. Like nobody really cares. You're either reinforcing something they believe or telling them something opposite. You're either pissing yeah. them off or making them happy, but you ain't changing anybody yeah. for the better. <laughs> it's so true. This was my first year calling games. Yeah. For, and, and it's funny, the negative tweets you would get are, are only from the teams that are losing. Yes. Because I, I, was, I never did shoot. I, did, I was doing the calling games. Yeah. And I would get trapped. Brenneman's terrible, oh, but it's yeah. only the losing Because you're team. criticizing <laughs> exactly. why they're losing. Exactly. No, Ray, Steve, Ray, and I had the funnest thing. We'd get in the car after Monday night that the post game show because back then we do the pregame show mm -hmm. we'd sit on the Monday Night Football bus during the show and then we have that late sports center show yeah. so we get done and call it one in the morning and the first thing we did we're like okay who's got the worst one and <laughs> we'd open up Twitter and we'd compete on the way to the hotel or the yeah. the private jet wherever wherever we were going we were competing with who could who had the meanest thing said about him that night I love it <laughs> <laughs> and it was hilarious. Like, Steve, you know, I think I got you beat, Ray. Yeah. And Steve would read something in the back seat. Or I'd like, guys, I, you know, they hate me more than they hate you. Let me read you this one. And we'd read the negative stuff, and we laughed our tails off on it. That's great. I love it. Um, last few things I got for you. I appreciate all your time, Coach. Um, you, know, you, you talked about some of the adversity in your life. I know you've had adversity in your personal life, mm -hmm. too. I've heard you talk about it on Elite 11 stuff and mm -hmm. stuff I've seen on TV. L looking back on your life, what's maybe one moment that's shaped who you are right now? Well, I think losing our son has shaped us the most. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, I was very me-centric up until that time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a nature of a professional athlete, you're kind of, you kind of need to be selfish for success. Mm -hmm. Like I encourage players, like yeah. you need to be somewhat selfish for success. But like my whole life was about me mm -hmm. and when you lose something that is so precious to you, your only mm -hmm. son, you start looking at life very differently. Mm -hmm. And my life went from being about me to being others centric. And, and I find a lot of joy, we find a lot of healing in, in helping other people. Mm -hmm. um, I think part of that is why I've been drawn to Elite 11. Those are boys. And mm -hmm. it's been funny now, in the midst of starting Elite 11, his age has matched up 
with each level oh, yeah. I've coached. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. It's never been perfect, but like I was coaching Elite 11, he would have been a 15, 16, yeah. 17, 8 year. I go to Lipscomb, he was right about that age. Mm -hmm. Now I'm at UAB, he'd be 25 right now. Mm -hmm. So not exactly, but the same yeah. kind of age uh, demographic. And, and I've been able to use the pain of that loss to fill my love tank with being able to have a chance to parent boys that are similar age to what mm -hmm. he would be at this time. Um, I think my, my whole family, my wife, my three daughters, we've kind of just decided that, you know, one of the ways pain goes away is by giving your life away. Mm -hmm. And we've, I think that's been one of the biggest things that shaped who we've been as a family, <clears throat> excuse me, and me personally um, since that. I will add some football scars too, is that, you know, the pain of failing on a public stage is real now. There's some PTSD yeah. to being the worst quarterback in the NFL my second year. There's some PTSD to losing football games, having fan bases not like you. Um, and I think that loss of my son, some of those, those scars for my career, uh, has also made me very passionate about helping others not mm -hmm. go through that same pain. Yeah. Um, let's just bring it back to Jacob, because I know you're going to talk to him. Like, a lot of what we do with our quarterbacks, Jacob included, is please, please, please trust me on this. Don't do that. <laughs> because I know where this keep, I know where this will make you end up. And yeah. I don't want you to feel that, right? Yeah. And that's with all of our quarterbacks. I, with a lot of our players, as we're trying to like introduce something bigger than just football to them, I keep telling them, guys, I know maybe your families or your friends, or you don't think this is the danger ranger lurking, mm -hmm. but I've made that knucklehead mistake and it was habitual in my life. And let me show you the pain that causes yeah. for me and others later on. I hope they're listening because we're really trying to stop them from making the decisions that cause a lot of pain later. Yeah. Um, I love asking this question because, especially someone like you who's, who's seen a lot of football, what's the best advice you've ever received? Treat others as you want to be treated. In the football, if you should have football context, mm -hmm. is true there too. Yeah. Um, but just in life, like choose to treat people the way you want to be treated. Mm -hmm. um, in football, I always wanted to be treated honestly, right? I got lied to, deceived. Um, and it hurt when you found the truth out uh, and it made you jaded. You know, I spent a big time in my career being jaded and skeptical. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, we're so afraid to tell people hard truths, but they actually deep down want to hear the truth. Yeah. Um, so that's one way. And there's just respect. Like just, you know, I think it, it, whether you're a good player or I, I just got a great text from a walk on that has moved on and is going somewhere else. I got a great, this is this morning actually. And he just thanked me for treating them like all the starters. Mm -hmm. And it That's made cool. me really proud because cool. I want to make sure that no matter who you are in this building, you, you, I, they need to know from me that they're valued. Mm -hmm. um, they need to feel important. Uh, remember, they're the biggest deal at their kitchen table with their families. Mm -hmm. Right, their issue that they're going through is the biggest issue in their family. Yeah. Whether you're throwing touchdowns or a practice dummy in practice, mm -hmm. like you still have a lot of value. Yeah. And uh, I think treating people in a football context with value has become a lost art. Like you're you're a commodity too often instead of somebody that's just truly valued as a human being. And yeah, you might mm -hmm. might not be as good at playing football as he is. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make you a lesser person. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's the North Star for you? What, what's the what's the goal? I don't I've never been a big goal guy. I get argued <laughs> with this all the time. I'm a dream guy and I'm a vision guy. Yeah. Uh, and I'm a process guy. Mm -hmm. So um, I think every group of five coaches is going to say this, but I would love to get us to college football playoff. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think you can dream much bigger than that. At the group <laughs> of five level. Yeah. Um, but to get you there would dramatically change this athletic department. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it would not just change the football program, yeah. it would dramatically change. Community, change. yeah. It would change everything. Yeah. You know, you're, you're in a state with Alabama and Auburn. Yeah. You better do something significant, mm -hmm. right? Truly, truly, truly significant in this state um, to grab any of the attention yeah. away from those two programs. Um, I think that's the North Star. Uh, honestly, I don't think I will coach 
a super long time. Mm. Uh, having a grandson now, as soon as he starts hitting 200 yard bombs, yeah. <laughs> you're gonna want to see. It. He'll know where <laughs> to find me, baby. I will be his caddy. <laughs> Decker knows this. He's only 17 months old. This has been made very clear to him. As soon as you're piping out 200 yard drives, yeah. which I give him to about five, um, my butt will be on the golf course <laughs> with him, and I'll have other grandchildren by yeah. then too. So. Um, I, I don't see this being, uh, I'm doing this at 65. Yeah. I see me doing this. Um, I've given myself nine years. I'm 51. I've given myself nine years to like run the race and chase it mm. and give these kids and these coaches everything that I have and win championships and change communities. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm all in, but God, I, I might be the one if I get this program to the college football playoff and my daughter <laughs> texts me and says, Hey, you got 189 in the simulator today. I'm like, <laughs> Peace. <laughs> we'll be at 200 soon. I am out. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll break your 218 day record. Right? Exactly. Oh, with him, I'm gonna count yeah. caddying in there. So. I love it. Uh, last thing, I I end most of my podcasts with this question: what, What's your why? What What drives you every single day? It's my faith. It really is, and I don't want to do the make uncomfortable for everybody with the <laughs> Jesus thing. But it, I've been following the Lord since I was 10. I've had a rocky road in my faith journey. Um, but I think when you lose a child, and, and Trevin at five years old received the, uh, Jesus to be his Lord and Savior at a, at a pancake house hostess stand. <laughs> so I know where he's at. Yeah. And that assurance of eternal life for him and for my family and for the people I have influence on is what drives me the most. Yeah. I love it. Well, Coach, I appreciate all your time. It's been fun to see your journey through coaching now. and. I know UAB is going to be a successful program for a long time because you're here. So I appreciate, I appreciate your time. I, this was Thank fun. Thank you yeah, so appreciate much. appreciate it. It was awesome.